Throughout the history of science fiction, writers, authors, and directors have come up with a ton of predictions of how the future will be. The Jetsons, Back to the Future, The Terminator, 2001 A Space Odyssey, War Games, Blade Runner, Her. Without fail, these predictions kept feeling further and further away from reality. And then, at some point, we started to see some major breakthroughs specifically in AI. Whatever that moment was, it totally flipped the script. Now, instead of predictions feeling further away, we're seeing predictions come to pass quicker and quicker. What was once something that could be two to three years away, we're now seeing in two to three months. We went from punch cards to this. We went from a Perceptron to this video generation. We went from old school phone operators to AI avatars conducting interviews for us. But what was that point where exponential growth kicked in and things started to happen way faster than pop culture and human perception could even keep up with? The truth is it's practically impossible for humans to keep up with and anticipate where all of this AI stuff is gonna go because, well, we really don't have a strong grasp of how exponential growth actually works. Now to really visualize this, we need to go all the way back to the beginning and look at all of the pivotal moments and huge advancements in AI history, starting with what we'll call the rule-based era of the 1950s through 1970s. We'll call it the rule-based era because back then, AI was really a series of if this, then that statements. So starting in 1950, this is when Alan Turing proposed the Turing test. It was originally called the imitation game, but this was the first time that somebody actually proposed the idea that AI might one day be smart enough that we'll need a test to tell it apart from humans. Fast forward to the summer of 1956, and we have the Dartmouth Summer Research Project. This is when a large group of researchers all came together to try to collect collectively figure out how to get to smart artificial intelligence. In fact, it was this research project where John McCarthy first coined the term artificial intelligence all the way back in 1956. Then in 1957, Frank Rosenblatt developed the Perceptron. This is when they started using weighted inputs to get a desired output. Think of it like this. If you're trying to get a desired output from a machine and you have a bunch of data to give that machine to help you come up with the desired output, well, the data that you gave that machine may not all be as important as the other data in that machine. So what do you do? You give weight to the various data that you put in. Some data is weighted higher than others to help get the desired output. They also got to use these cute little sheets of paper with darkened boxes to represent the weights. Then in 1966, the world got its first AI chatbot called Eliza. It was created by Joseph Weizenbaum out of MIT, and it was designed to be like an AI psychologist. Eliza would ask you how you were feeling and then follow up with another question based on your response. Eliza might ask, how are you feeling today? You might respond, I'm feeling okay. Eliza would say, why are you feeling okay? Then you might say, I didn't get a great night's sleep last night. Then Eliza would reply, why didn't you get a good night's sleep last night? Maybe I went to bed too late. Why did you go to bed too late? And so on. It would essentially take what you just answered with and then turn it into a why question, mimicking a psychologist that's trying to get you to go deeper and deeper with why you're feeling the way you're feeling. But not long after the AI world was hit with its first AI winter, from the 1970s all the way through the mid 1980s. A report came out that was critical of the Perceptron concept, causing people to lose faith in the direction of AI. As a result, funding dried up and well, computers just weren't powerful enough yet for people to really do what they wanted to do with them. But then in the mid 80s, we saw a bit of a resurgence with the machine learning era. This era was defined by data-driven AI. AI was starting to learn from patterns inside of data rather than just from if this then that sort of rule-based statements. And in 1986, a trio of researchers, Jeffrey Hinton, Dave Rummelhart, and Ronald Williams released the backpropagation algorithm. This was a method of deep training in the very beginning of neural networks. In the same way that the Perceptron would take weighted inputs and turn it into your outputs, this backpropagation algorithm did essentially the same thing. It was just a more digitized version that used modern computers at the time. 
However, a big difference with backpropagation was that it could take its own outputs and then turn around and feed them back into the system and learn from its own mistakes. It would repeat this process and feed the outputs back in again, constantly adjusting its own weights until you finally receive the desired outcome. This was a huge advancement for being able to train neural networks. Then in 1989, Jan LeCun developed Lynette while working at Bell Labs. Now, Lynette was one of the first and probably the most influential convolutional neural network. This is a neural network that can actually recognize and understand what it's looking at and pretty much all modern image recognition algorithms that are in use today are still using a very similar method to what Jan LeCun created back in 1989. But after that, things got quiet again, and we were hit with the second AI winter. Companies went bankrupt, research funding dried up, and, well, skepticism towards AI was on the rise. But then in 1997, AI took center stage again when IBM's Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess. Kasparov was the reigning world chess champion, and to this day, he's still considered one of the best chess players ever. Now, while technically Deep Blue used a rule-based model to beat Kasparov, it put AI center stage for the world again. Then in 1999, NVIDIA released the GeForce 256. This is widely considered to be the first modern GPU. While CPUs were designed to do really complex processing, sort of one calculation at a time, GPUs were able to do a whole bunch of slightly simpler tasks simultaneously. While this wasn't specifically a huge moment for AI, spoiler alert, GPUs become a pretty big deal in the future. Fast forward to 2006 and Jeffrey Hinton created the first deep belief network. This was a defining moment because AI was now able to learn based on a ton of data without requiring a whole bunch of human labeling. Before DBNs, AI was limited to how quickly humans could actually feed the machine. But now, AI could learn on its own. And then in 2007, something truly game-changing happened. NVIDIA released CUDA, which stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture. This actually allowed developers to start to use GPUs for general purpose development. Before this, they were primarily used just to make your games look better. Now they can be used for anything. And this was it. This was the moment where things really started to ramp up. Over the next few years, engineers and researchers and scientists really started to figure out what they can do with these GPUs combined with this new CUDA architecture. And it led us into the third era, the era we're in right now, the deep learning era. The deep learning era is defined by using multiple neural networks. Now to define a deep neural network, let me quickly explain a neural network. A regular neural network is where you have an input, there's a hidden layer where the processing happens, and then after the processing happens, you get the output. With a regular neural network, there's only one hidden layer in between the input and the output. With a deep neural network, it's like passing it through a whole bunch of hidden layers inside of the neural network now, instead of it just passing through one layer. So you give it an input, and it essentially passes through all sorts of different neural networks before finally coming out as the output. They're much more complex, but also gave the ability for AIs to become much smarter. And once scientists figured out how to use deep neural networks with GPUs and this CUDA architecture, things exploded. In 2011, IBM's Watson won on Jeopardy! once again bringing AI to the forefront of the world's consciousness. It was also the year that Apple launched Siri and we got the first AI voice assistant. Then in 2012, Google Brain demonstrated unsupervised feature learning. They gave it unlabeled YouTube videos and it was able to actually figure out what was in those videos. In 2013, DeepMind's DQN learned how to play Atari games at a superhuman level. Then in 2014, we got GANs or Generative Adversarial Networks, which was the first system that allowed AI to generate realistic images and deepfakes. In 2015, Google started deploying TPUs or tensor processing units instead of GPUs. They were like GPUs, but specifically designed for machine learning. In 2016, DeepMind's AlphaGo 
defeated Lee Sado, the world champion in Go, something that people thought would never be possible from AI. In 2017, the paper Attention is All You Need was published. It introduced the world to the Transformer architecture and is still the same architecture that's used in pretty much all modern AI models. In 2018, OpenAI released GPT-1. The T in GPT stands for Transformer, which we just mentioned. Now, GPT-1 wasn't very smart yet, but it showed a lot of potential. Then in 2019, OpenAI released GPT-2. This one was massively scaled up, and this is when public concern towards how good these AI models might get started to bubble up. In 2019, we also got AlphaStar from DeepMind, which figured out how to master games like StarCraft II. In 2020, we got GPT-3 from OpenAI. This was a massively scaled up model and was the first natural language model that really, really started to impress people. We also got AlphaFold 2 from DeepMind in 2020. This model was capable of solving the protein folding problem, which is accelerated drug discovery and led researchers to now start using AI to formulate new drugs. In 2021, OpenAI released Dolly 1, the first transformer-based image generation model. In 2022, we got even more image generation models like Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. And then in November of 2022, another huge pivotal moment happened. OpenAI released ChatGPT to the world. It became one of the fastest growing products in history and cemented AI in the entire public's mind. Then in 2023, they upped it even more and launched GPT-4. Also in 2023, Meta released their Llama open source model, which opened the floodgates for future open source large language models. 2023 was also the year that Google launched Gemini. In 2024, OpenAI introduced Sora to the world, showing us that we can actually get realistic videos out of AI. We also saw GPT-40 and 01 in 2024. In 2025, NVIDIA released the Blackwell GPUs, which further accelerated the ability to train AI models. We then got GPT-4.5, followed by, for some reason, GPT-4.1, and then Llama 4. And as I record this today, ChatGPT is one of the 10 most visited websites on the entire internet. When you see everything in the way we just presented it, it's a little bit easier to understand the exponential growth. But when you're living it, in the moment, a lot of these huge events just come and go. So will this trend continue or will we hit another AI winter? If you look at the previous AI winters, they all involve some sort of funding cut. And with the importance being placed on AI today, the widespread adoption, and every major company really leaning into AI, I'd say it's unlikely to happen. On the other hand, with everything moving so quickly, it's also possible that the next AI winter will come and go before we even notice that it happened. AI is getting so advanced now that AI is helping us advance AI. Humans are no longer the bottleneck, which means things are more likely to keep growing exponentially. I started this video by mentioning that people are kind of unable to understand exponential growth. And what sums up that point more than how we are constantly moving the goalposts? There's a famous line coined by John McCarthy. He said, as soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. For example, Alexa, Siri, Google Home, those were originally considered AI and nobody even thinks of them as AI anymore. Alan Turing originally had a concept for what we should be looking out for when applying the Turing test. I think that we can confidently say that today's AI models likely far surpass whatever Alan Turing had in mind back at the time. And what's so crazy to me is that we got to this point and we barely even noticed.